So I think we'll get started. So welcome to how to create an intentional, equitable, hybrid work environment with all voices and single sprout. Um, I am Natan Fisher. In just a second, I'm going to pass it around to everyone and to give an introduction. Um, our goal here is to share a tangible ways folks can think about creating an intentional work uh, environment in a hybrid or remote environment. Um, and as someone pointed out, you know, we will have um, a recording by the end of next week sent out by all voices. Um, just some intro stats to, to think about. Uh, the world of work is changing and especially the role of physical office. Um, one Gallup poll said about 53% expect to, to have a hybrid arrangement, 24% fully remote. Um, another study found that 91% of remote capable employees prefer to work exclusively remote or hybrid. So this is uh, a big trend. First of all, very, very thankful to All Voices. Um, all Voices is an employee intelligence platform to systematically ask for, accept, analyze, and act on feedback of all kinds. You'll find good ideas and bad actors in real time, reducing turnover, recruiting costs. It's a great product. If you haven't already, please check them out. Um, employees need to feel heard. We're gonna talk about that. They need to belong. Um, and it won't be long before your company culture reflects your values, depending on what you allow and depending on what data you get. Um, I'm Natan Fisher, co-founder, co-CEO of Single Sprout. We're a tech and legal focused recruiting firm. We heavily focus in uh, software engineering recruiting. Um, we're not like most recruiting firms. We leverage technology, data. That's another reason that I love all voices to help candidates and companies find the best fit quicker. Um, and again, we work very, very much so with um, VC backed tech companies and law firms. So I'm Natan, my pronouns are uh, he, him. Um, and, you know, just a little bit about our work environment right now, we're fully remote. We've done meetups. Um, we're doing a company wide retreat. I think uh, one of my favorite parts of the flexibility is um, being able to hire people across the country, being able to, to offer an opportunity to someone that might not have had that opportunity before. Um, but it's a work in progress. And it's something that I'm really excited about this conversation to learn more about. So I am going to pass it to Celeste, Jasmine, Barisol, and then uh, Adrian. Good day, everyone. It's so, so great to be here. Thank you so much, Natan, for, for having us and having me. Um, I, again, am Celeste Bell, I'm head of all things people, talent, and diversity at Deutsche New York, a full-service creative agency uh, based in New York City. Um, right now, our company um, is in a hybrid type of scenario, but we're remote first. Um, our offices are open for folks who want to go into the office, but not required for, for anyone to go into the office. Uh, for the folks that are going into the office, we offer lunch on Tuesdays. Uh, so Tuesdays tend to be the days that everyone gathers for the free food. Um, and I think there was a question, you know, in terms of, of, of prep, I, um, I think the thing that I love the most about remote, um, this remote work and this remote world now um, is hanging out with my seven-year-old pit bull uh, or pit bull mix. Uh, he has become my favorite coworker of all time. Uh, no offense to any of my coworkers if you're on, but uh, it's been amazing to actually spend time um, with my dog every single day and go on walks at lunch with my dog every single day. Um, that is the, the thing that I have enjoyed the most in addition to actually seeing my parents on a more regular basis and working from um, where they are as well. So uh, again, happy to be here and I uh, look forward to learning from, um, from the others on the, on the panel today. Hi everyone, I'm Jasmine Francis. Natan, thank you again for the really wonderful intro. It's hard to follow Celeste with her excitement, but I will do my best to follow. Um, I'm Jasmine Francis. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am the VP of People and Culture at Thinks, and at Thinks we create products for menstruation and incontinence that are sustainable and are amazing. 
Um, currently, we are a fully remote environment. Um, we do have employees dispersed across all of the United States. However, we are in fun times where we're really starting to think through what our return to office or off office opening strategy will look like. Um, but we we will see. We just actually uh, closed a survey and got some interesting results from our employees. Um, but one thing that I like the most about working remote is the fact that um, I get to just be me. And that doesn't mean that I'm not able to be me when I'm in the office, but there's definitely a level of comfortability and psychological safety. And um, especially, you know, I deal with anxiety and things like that. So having that comfortability in my own home provides me with a level of comfort that allows me to do better work. Um, and so that's, that's what I've loved so far. Thank you. All right, I'll go next. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me as well. My name is Vera Silvega. My pronouns are she, her. And I am also defined by being a wife, a mom, a sister, a friend, and I do hope a mentor to all things people and culture. I am the chief people officer at Box, and Box is an e-commerce e retailer and e-commerce enabler. Our mission is very simple. We help the world stock up through technology, and we operate an e-commerce retail service that provides bulk pantry consumables to businesses and household customers all over the U.S. I lead all the people strategies at Box, including things that I love, including talent management, employee engagement, and really, truly building a world-class culture focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I also love, love the future of work and everything that it holds, and I do think as HR practitioners, all of this is in our hands to create of what this is going to look like in the future and honestly in decades to come. In terms of what our office looks like, we're also hybrid, but we're also trying to think through of what the workforce plans are going to look like into 2023 and beyond. Uh, food is also the great equalizer, and so we do have designated days that are for lunch and collaboration. And this is, I'm, and I have to say, if there's anything that is united folks at Box, like we, we will come in for food, which is great. In terms of what is my favorite part about being hybrid, I'm also going to say, Celeste, similar to you, it's my dog. And just the idea that I can, it is how I start my day. I have to say, this is how I center my day. The idea of walking out every single morning, clearing my head, going for a walk with him is the most calming part of my day. I'm also really big into yoga and Pilates and to me, that is just non-negotiable now. And it's something that even three years ago, I never would have been able to do that at, I don't know, six, seven o'clock in the morning. Like, oh man, when can I go to the gym? Like, oh, it's going to be like seven o'clock at night. So I do love that. But it's also nice to, I have three teenagers and it's just, I can make them breakfast. And it's not usually this, it's typically like cereal and donuts of the run before getting them to school. So there is that, you know, there is that silver lining that I think we all love. So that's me. Thanks again for having me. All right. Hi, I'm Adrienne Barnard. Um, I'm also really excited and grateful to be here. Uh, I'm the SVP of, oh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the SVP of People Ops and Experience at Mainstay. We're an ed tech and workforce startup uh, that is an engagement platform that helps schools and businesses support uh, students and employees through every step of their journey. Um, we are fully remote. We actually got rid of our office at the end of December last year. So we are figuring out this world as a fully remote organization, though I will say we've kind of already been figuring that out since, you know, the middle of 2020. Um, and I think to kind of summarize what everyone else said, my favorite part is really being able to embrace work-life integration. So being able to be you because you're in your space where you're most comfortable at home, being able to go for a walk in the middle of the day, really integrate your life as you need to. My dog is also here with me all the time, right behind me <laughs> in my non blurred background. Um, but just really being able to embrace, you know, creating a culture and a workplace environment that is truly about work life integration. In some ways, I think it's a little bit easier in a fully remote culture, though, of course, there are challenges as well, though I do fully believe that the future of work is hybrid. I think 
employees want choice and they do want spaces with food to go into from time to time. So I think there's really interesting, exciting challenges as we go forward, because I know there's plenty of office space still out there and there are plenty of people that do really well working in offices and want to have that experience as well. So I'm excited to get into it and talk about it today. Awesome. Um, cool. And I'm just looking at kind of the results from the poll. Um, we have 63% in a hybrid environment right now, 2% fully in person, 35% remote, um, average size of the company somewhere between 10 and a thousand. Good, good number. And then, um, you know, why did we want to attend this, this seminar hybrid environment, looking for best practices, working in talent and culture. So that's kind of our, our demo here. Um, so I think we have some amazing topics. I'm really excited. I think this is super relevant. There is a lot going on in this world. Uh, and, you know, the best way I think that I could summarize how do we get together is communication. And that's a, a great topic to start things off. And I want to understand, um, you know, how communication has changed in a hybrid or work in a remote environment. Um, for example, like signaling culture expectations, um, opportunities to over communicate, um, resetting company culture, you know, right now there's reorgs, there's layoffs, you know, how do you make sure as a founder, it's tough because you want to be there in person sometimes and just, you know, be able to hold people, but we don't have that luxury and maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not, but how are you, um, dealing with that and and sharing you know words with your with your team on how to best practice and i'll start with uh varicel there wonderful first of all natan this is i'm i'm so excited to talk about this and if anything hr practitioners always knew that over communication was key before the pandemic and now it is something that it is this is something that we have to build into our muscle and refine more and more each day. So for us, I'm a massive believer in over communication. I will say something 10,000 times and I will say it again. I will make sure that my HR business partners and the entire team are overemphasizing this. And we are going to do this via Slack, via, um, via you know, just chatting in the office. We're gonna do this via email, but it's incredibly important. Hybrid is great. And I think if anything, everybody loves the terms that come with it such as flexibility, but it's also a challenge because it's about that balance and it's about that inclusion and making sure that we are making sure that we are taking care of everybody across the US. And there is this out of sight, out of mind mentality that comes into play sometimes like, oh crap, I forgot. Like, what about, you know, what about the folks over here, over there? In terms of what we have been doing, technology is key. And if anything, I think over the past couple of years, if there's, uh, if there has been any sort of transformation, it has been in HR and what I call this modernization of HR, there's a crazy and an incredible digital transformation that's going on with us. And to me, from a tactical perspective, it's about creating this tech HR infrastructure where we can get information out at our fingertips. And while we can tell people while walking down the hallway because we are coming into an office, but for us, it's building an HR infrastructure from the technology standpoint and from a communication standpoint that we can get the message out quickly and a moment's notice. So that sets the tone. It shows that you know we are on top of it. We will always communicate left, right, and up and down. But from that other aspect and from a cultural perspective, we have to be incredibly intentional about going above and beyond. We celebrate wins and we tell our leaders, like we use Slack, we tell everyone just somebody did a great job, put it on Slack, let the entire universe know this. And so it's just not the specific team that knows that they've done a great job, but the rest of the company does this as well. So there are tools to use out there. We use Lattice, which is a praise, when there's a praise channel. And so somebody did a great job, you know, it's there's nothing like getting a global high five and getting all these emojis of thumbs up, great job that just make folks feel really good about themselves. And it's also about transparency. I think also if the pandemic has taught us everything is that the world is shifting and there cannot be this notion of you must be back in the office or you must do this. 
I live in New York City where we are the epicenter of everything, but you know what? HR practitioners and I tell my HRBPs too, but we also need to stay on top of the news. And because there is a health crisis that's going to be out there for, you know, it, it's kind of been built into everything that we do. Like for us, it's safety first. And we tell that all the time. And you know what, even if you haven't heard from somebody in a day, like we, you know, we train our HRBP. So like you got to go out there and just check in. Nobody's ever going to fault you for checking in. or like, how are you doing? So I think there's this massive opportunity for HR folks right now to really take the bull by the horns and be that over communicator. Yeah. And I'm not talking about being chief communications oftener, but really checking in, being intentional and leading with authenticity that, you know, like we want to make sure that you are doing your best work and tell us what we can do smarter, better, faster in order to build high performing teams. So that's yeah. kind of my take on that in a nutshell. Yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you, Vericell. And just summarizing that um, over communicating, saying things 10,000 times, email, Slack, using technology, uh, celebrating employees and making it known to not just their teams, but their orgs or the whole company um, and transparency and just understanding that things are shifting and calling those out. Um, I want to stay on the topic. And there was a great question, which was, you know, the, I think the technology is clear and, and thank you for mentioning specific tools. Um, any thoughts, Jasmine, Adrian, Celeste, on how to, how, how to try to connect a little bit more on the human side? Um, which is not always easy when we're not in person. I, I have a couple of quick thoughts that I'm happy to share. Um, I think I, I loved what you said, Varisa, like setting the stage for this communication strategy, which really is about over communication and using all the channels. I think the um, for us from a fully remote environment, I think Slack, love it or hate it, is just a super powerful tool, just that in the moment on demand style of, and whatever you use, whether it's Slack or Teams, I know some companies even use WhatsApp. Um, I think that having something where people can communicate one-to-one -one or one to a few or one to everyone directly and quickly, I think is really important. Um, because the, the one to one slacks can be very personal and can really give an opportunity for a deeper connection. Some people communicate better via written text than they do talking over a video screen or talking over the phone as well. Um, and I think that a couple exa example of that is we offer, um, we have a shout out channel as well, tied to a different tool, but it's kind of all that they're all the same. Um, and but we also give space for those at our bi-weekly all hands meetings as well. And so I think just, even if it's the same shout out in both places, that helps continue to boost that person, but also some people don't check that channel and some people don't go, excuse me, don't go to the all hands meeting. So I think adding that layer, an example of over communication, I think is really helpful. And one other quick thing I wanted to add as an example in terms of a fully remote environment, I think, understanding where people are at and how they're feeling and how they're doing can be challenging in a remote environment. But I think trust your gut as an HR leader, because you tend to typically have a sense of that, but also don't be, don't back down from being really explicit about those ground rules that we used to be able to set a little bit more easily when we were all together. And an example of that is hosting something like an AMA or a Q&A. I used to do these in person with the company I was at before the pandemic, and it was really easy to, you know, see everyone's face in the room and kind of set the tone of appropriateness and, you know, not, you know, asking questions that were out of bounds, right? Because we were all right there or the CEO could say something directly. But in suddenly in a remote environment, that's a little bit more challenging when people have their cameras off and it's a little bit more awkward sometimes over Zoom to do that. So I was just really explicit and clear and laid out really significant guidelines tied to our values and shared those ahead of the meeting so that people understood walking in, here's what's expected of me in this space. And here's how Adrian or potentially other executives might hold me accountable to how I show up in this space. So I think there are ways that you can transfer that kind of in-person vibe into clear expectations as well. And I just encourage people to think about that also. I love that. I think uh, the guidelines on the values, you know, using your values in a remote environment in any company 
is just extra, extra, extra important. I've learned that from Jasmine and I've learned that from Celeste and so many other great HR leaders. Um, yeah, and I like that. I like that. The Q&A is something that I don't think enough companies do um, and on a consistent basis and let people express their feelings, but obviously keep the conversation focused and aligning with values. Jasmine or Celeste, any thoughts on communication in the environment that you're in? So similar to Adrian, we do a lot of the same things. So uh, we have an all hands weekly. Um, we start our we start our, our weeks on Monday with a Monday morning huddle. Um, it's where our CEO um, basically shares out like the things that are happening, any new business updates, uh, anything that's happening on the business front uh, so that the company knows what's going on. On that call, we also celebrate birthdays, we celebrate anniversaries, uh, we speak to the events, anything that's coming up that employees should be a part of. Um, we also, um, so we we have a champions program. It's our employee recognition program. And so we uh, recognize three employees um, every month. So this is once, once a month um, on a huddle but these people are nominated by their peers and then selected um, the leadership team, the executive leadership team selects who the three champions for each month are gonna be. We recognize these champions um, at the huddle as well. And so it, it's an opportunity for us to recognize them live. Uh, and if they wanna say anything, you know, to accept their award, they can. Um, but we also share everything that's going on that's happened via Slack. So like, of course that technology piece, so very important because you know, you're right, everyone's not going to show up um, to every all hands meeting, but we want them to, to be involved. We want them to know what's, what's happened and who's been recognized and what's going on. And so we, we we do very much the same things. Um, and then at the end of the week, on Fridays, we have a Friday newsletter. It's capturing the things that have happened. We're recognizing new hires uh, in the newsletter as well. Uh, we've asked them like some fun facts, some things that, you know, that are interesting about themselves so that people can get to know them in a more, in a more personal way um, since we're not in the office. Um, our CEO also sends out um, a Friday note. And that Friday note is just basically summing up what's happened during the week. If something, if something major in the world, something tragic in the world has happened, she's recognizing that, um, recognizing that we are humans and recognizing that those things impact our psyche. Those things you know, are, they, they dictate how we are, are coming, coming up, uh, showing up at work. Um, and so she she's always recognizing those things um, in the Friday notes as well. Uh, and it's just a send off, you know, it's a send off into the weekend. Um, it's a it's a, a note of gratitude and appreciation for for everyone's efforts. Uh, it's not the same note every single week. Um, but again, it's a bookend. So Monday morning huddles, Friday, you know, Friday re recap of the week. And I thank you, Celeste. I would agree with everything that's been said. Um, the only thing I'd add is what else has been different um, in a hybrid slash remote environment is the fact that it's it's not only about how we communicate to our employees, but that the other side of it is recognizing that employees have different ways of communicating. And so working in a remote environment or hybrid environment really highlights the fact that we all have different personality types and we all communicate very differently. And as HR practitioners, how do we recognize and speak in a way that's going to be understood based on who we're speaking with? Um, so that's been interesting for me as well as just understanding that, you know, if there's an ER issue, for example, is it really an issue that's going on? Or is it the fact that someone speaking communication communication A and someone speaking slightly different at communication B? And do we need to just make sure that we are building a bridge to help them better communicate better with one another? Because now that we're not in the office all the time and we're not picking up on those social, social cues as much, it's really important that how we communicate is intentional, we're clear, we're crisp, and not only from an HR practitioner perspective, but employees with one another. And when, it's, when that's not there, things get lost in translation and from that sparks conflict and et cetera, et cetera. So it's been interesting to kind of see it both ways, one from an HR practitioner way, but then also understanding how the communication has shifted within the employee base as well. 
Thank you so much. That um, so many great ideas in there. Um, I think Jasmine, obviously, this is two way communication, not one way communication that speaks for itself. Um, Celeste, I really love the idea of a, an internal newsletter. I think a lot of companies don't do that, especially recognizing what's happening in the world. It's on so many people's mind, especially um, I want to go out and say like people early in their careers, you know, very, very, very plugged into social media, very plugged into world events. And obviously we all have our own personal lives too, um, but important to recognize what's going on. Um, yeah, I think let's turn the page for right now um, and, and think about a little bit more of, you know, what's happening. I think one thing that, that where my head goes to now is, is training. Uh, training, especially on the leadership team, on the managerial team, um, because so much of that obviously is, you know, that communication you can handle as a people leader. But when it gets to the team level, there can be breakdowns. And so, you know, my question, and this is for Jasmine to start is, how do you differently equip managers to manage in a remote or hybrid world, you know, really empower their teams and ensure they're fostering, you know, an equitable and, and inclusive environment? It's a big question. <laughs> No pressure at all. Um, so I, you know what, it's really interesting because I think the first, my first inclination is to think and recognize that we are all going through something. We are all human and we all have lives outside of our main jobs. And so there's an element of humanity that must be looked at through that lens when we're thinking about how do we train our people managers and how do we train our employees because when we look at when we look to our people managers to be able to level up and or train their employees we have to recognize that they're probably going through something too or who knows what's going on in their life so First, making sure that everyone's on the same playing field with we're all human and we all understand that we're not only balancing what we have in front of us with our job, but we're also balancing other things that may not be as relevant. So I think that's step number one. Step number two, I would say, is recognizing kind of what I was saying before, that everybody is different. How we speak to each other, how we train one another, it's no longer the one size fits all, click a, click a couple of buttons and you complete this training 100%. It's how do we really make sure that we are, number one, understanding the purpose of the training, we're understanding what our current state is, and we're meeting employees where they are, and they're able to digest it in a way that's as intended. And so does that mean we need to be more interactive about our training? Does that mean that we need to maybe uh, do smaller circles of people managers versus all the people managers within the organization? But I think there's, it begs the question of, can we offer a lot more flexibility and inclusivity with how we train people and meeting them where they are so that we know exactly how we uplevel them? I would say third, it's, uh, again, recognizing that people learn very differently um, and being a keen of how people learn differently and using that to embed the, the strategy in the format and the infrastructure of training, I think is also really important. Um, I would say along with that, not necessarily from a strict training perspective, but just from like what Vericell was saying of always having those touch bases, it's important for people managers to always have that real-time touch base with their teams so that they have a pulse of how they're feeling, what the gaps are, what they can do to close those gaps, which then informs how training should be designed. So there's, there's lots of different elements, I would say, um, from a training perspective, um, but I would, I guess, continue to just encourage employees and people managers in specific to empower their teams by meeting their teams where they are, recognizing that they're human and people managers are human and figuring out and being intentional about what the gaps are and how to address things in a way that's going to be digested as intended. Amazing. I heard, um, you know, so true, but starting with, you know, people are humans. They're perfectly imperfect. They make mistakes, just like all of us, which we, we're humans too. Um, and, you know, it's not one size fits all. You know, people learn differently. I think those touch bases are super important. Just to put you on the spot, Jasmine, and I know everyone's different, but for your own cadence with your team, how often are you touching base? I touch base every day. 
I'm in touch with my team every single day, um, be it Slack uh, over chat, be it I just randomly call over Slack and say, hey, how you doing? How you feeling today? What's going on? Um, we have more structured one-on-ones um, with each one of my direct reports. And I also, it's also not just about like what's being said, but it's those unspoken movements. It's the body language. It's the reactions that also tell me do I need to check in additionally with my team? How are they feeling? So I, I feel really good about the cadence of how I'm checking on my teams. And I've decided to check in with them in the way that I do, just because I've learned that they're more receptive to face-to-face -face reaction and or typing. So um, that, that method works best for me, although I understand that everyone has their own way of communication and you have to pick what works best for your respective teams. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And I, again, I know everyone's different and people want to be checked in less or more and depends on the person. That's why it's so important to ask them and get on the same page and align there. Um, I want to turn the page just a little bit to, to in the same vein, creating meaningful connections. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about like, you know, Barisol talked about, you know, not must having people into the office. Um, but how do we create that expectation of, you know, meaningful connection or in a remote environment or meaningful connection in the hybrid environment? I, I want to, if we can get to just like some, some rock solid points here that can help the people today, Celeste and Adrian, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So for me, um, and I, Natan, I think I've shared this with you, uh, personally before, with my company, uh, the company that I'm at right now, Deutsche New York, I actually feel more connected to the folks, you know, that I've worked with here than I have at some of the other companies I've worked with where I went into an office five days a week. Um, I interviewed uh, remotely. I was remote basically for the first 10 months of my experience um, before we reopened our office for folks to come in. And and it, there's a reason, like we have been very intentional about keeping people connected throughout the week. So as I mentioned, our week starts with the Monday morning huddle, of course, where our CEO is addressing, there's always people that are, that are, you know, chiming in, chiming in, um, in terms of, uh, the huddle, but throughout the week, there's stuff that's happening. So on Tuesdays, we have virtual, uh, virtual yoga which is open to everyone. On Wednesdays, we have virtual DFIT. It's a high intensity, high intensity fitness class um, with a personal trainer. Um, on Thursdays, um, Thursdays, we've got meditation in the morning, vir virtual meditation in the morning, but we also do um, a game night, um, a virtual happy hour every other week. So, you know, twice a month we're doing, you know, some, and it, it's not always a game night. Sometimes it's a cooking class. We've got a lot of, you know, chefs and bakers. And so they'll take us through uh, making their favorite, favorite something. Um, and we all do that together. It's an opportunity for us to see uh, their families, you know, like a lot of times their kids will, will come in and, and, and cook and bake with them. Um, so those are, that's on Thursday, but my favorite activity of the week is our coffee clutch. So our coffee clutch is basically a virtual water cooler moment. And I think it's actually better than break room conversation because everyone's involved in the conversation. So, you know, prior to COVID, you know, you, you connect with someone in the break room that you don't know, um, and you're having a one-to-one -one conversation. The five people that are, you know, in the room aren't a part of the conversation. With our coffee clutch, it literally is everyone a part of the conversation. And the way it works, we um, we do two two truths and a lie. There are rules that are sent out in ahead of time every single week, um, so everyone knows that we're going to keep it light. There's no politics and no no religion. Like we're we're keeping things really light. It's a Friday, so we got to keep things light on a Friday. Um, and so we have a guest um, and a host. So the host changes every week, um, and the guest changes every week. And the guest is sharing their two truths, two truths and a lie. Uh, we do a poll in Slack, you know, for people to guess what the lie is. So we put that out that out there in advance. That's on a Thursday, um, and then on Friday, the guest is sharing, like they're telling the stories, uh, and then of course they reveal whatever the lie is. Um, 
And that has been so much fun because we learn so much about our coworkers and their personal lives, the things that make them them. Um, again, it's one of my favorite activities uh, because we, we go from this two truths and a lie, because that's like maybe the first five, eight minutes of, of the 30 minute window that we allot for this. And the host comes prepared with some questions, like in terms of getting the entire, you know, whoever shows up because every it's open to the company and people, different people show up every single week. Um, but they come prepared with, you know, some questions like, what's your favorite, you know, like destination, you know, what's your favorite childhood memory, you know, like those types of things to get people talking about themselves to everyone else. And I've learned so much about our employees, not having spent like lots and lots of time with every single one of our, one of my employees, but I've learned so much about them through this one activity. And that's why I say it's actually better than break room activity, you know, break room, like running into them in, in a break room because everyone's learning about these employees at the same time. Um, so that's, that's the way we conduct our week every single week. These things are on the schedule every single week. Invitations are sent out every single week uh, for folks to be a part of these things. And there's no pressure for anyone to be a part of anything except the except the huddle. Like we do expect people to show up for the huddle unless they have like a client meeting or something. Um, but the rest of the week, it really is, you know, make the time if you can. And a lot of people do because it really is part of our culture. You know, it's, it's, it's how we, it's how we've stayed connected, you know, through the pandemic. And now that we're going into the office, you know, sometimes, you know, some people going into the office, nothing has actually changed. You know, people still, you know, still log in for, you know, yoga and coffee clutch and all of that. But they're also now connecting on Tuesdays, you know, if they decide to go in on Tuesdays for lunch and, it, and it's a different experience. Um, and, and so that's what's worked for us you know, over the last year and a half that I've been there, um, it, it has really been a lot of fun um, getting to know people in that way virtually. So it can, you don't actually have to be in person to make meaningful connections. You don't, you, you just have to be intentional. You know, you have to yeah. think through like, what do, wanna, what, what, do, what do people wanna do? And ask them, you know, like if, it's a, if people feel, feel like it's a waste of time, they'll tell you. <laughs> right, right. Getting that feedback, I think is so important after and making sure it's a good use of time. But I love the idea of activities. I love the general conversation. I mean, we do a once a month um, DEI conversation, just what's going also what's just going on in the world, mental health, we try to do things to open up people's minds and just have, you know, sometimes we're just sitting there in silence. And that's okay, because people are just sitting there in silence together. Um, and I can feel a connection of the team there. Um, I've also seen uh, a really neat practice called traditions remind me of something you said Celeste where uh, maybe at meetings or maybe the people you highlight share one thing they do outside of work that's just like a daily or a weekly or monthly tradition so it opens up other people to what's going on outside of work I'll pass it to, to Adrian um, so we've tried all the stuff that Celeste does and it did not work at Mainstay <laughs> we are a much smaller team so I'm assuming that you all have, we're only like 70 people. Um, and we really, and so we're, I'm a people ops team of one now as well. And I used to be a people ops team of two. So the, like the people resource to help with that stuff just doesn't exist as well. But just speaking from the perspective of the, it, and we're still super connected and people really know each other well. And, you know, there's so many different ways to go about it. And I think really the most important thing is to pay attention to the feedback you get from people and not try to, you know, I listen to you talk less and I'm like, that all sounds amazing. And I would totally participate in all of that, but it doesn't mean that the employees here would, and they didn't, you know, my people ops journalist loves to say she went to the most expensive yoga class she's ever been to because the yoga teacher costs like 350 bucks and she was the only one that showed up. So, you know, you have like, when those things are happening, you have to step back and say, okay, what do employees want? And they, they want more spontaneous, casual opportunities to connect that they facilitate. And so it might not be happening as regularly as 
you might think it should, or you might wish it was as a people ops lead who's paying attention to the culture and connection and, and community, but it works for the employees and they're very connected. What I will say is that I think it is important from time to time to take that pause and to take a moment out of a typical, maybe all hands meeting and use it for fun and celebration. So that's where I've put my energy and intention around, hey, we're always all together for the most part, every other week in our all hands. Why don't we use one to get to know each other a little bit better? And it was so fun. We went off into like small break rooms and had people at conversation. And then we came back and we shared learnings and it was hilarious and awkward and weird. Some of the stuff that we talked about, but that's our culture. And that those are, that's who works at Mainstay, which is awesome. And it was the most fun we'd had in a long time. And of course there were new hires on the call and you're thinking, oh my gosh, they must be like, what is this place I just joined? But it's real, right? This is who we are. This is our culture and community. So I think really the, for the most part is take ideas from what you see happening around you and what other companies are doing, try them out, but it's an experiment and pay attention to, you know, is this working? Is it not? And if it isn't, that's okay. There's so many different ways to go about it, but making that time for community building, I do think is important and reinforcing when it's happening and you're not a part of it also as a people ops lead, because I think that is so much more successful when a random employee is like, hey, anybody want to join me for a coffee chat and 15 people join and people ops didn't have to organize it like, yes, that's amazing. Let's keep more of that happening. So um, I think, you know, it can it can happen in many different ways. And I just want to highlight that, like, you don't have to be live and in person to build community and connection. It absolutely happens so deeply over video as well. And then when you do meet in person, it's even more exciting. Thank you. That was awesome. I love the feedback. I mean, that's, that's real. That's genuine. That's authentic. Getting people to speak up. It's like 90% of the battle sometimes. Varisol, anything to add? I agree with all those points. Celeste, I got it. I got it. I'm like writing that. I was trying to write down that. I'm like, I got to do this. But I think to that point as well, Culture is always built through every company, and we know this has a unique culture. And what worked for one company and what worked in your experience in one company doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate and be the same thing. And so, to that point, it's always like feedback. And while if you say, like, hey, we're going to do yoga on Tuesday because it sounds great, does one really want you? <laughs> does one like really want yoga? Um, or I, I've worked at companies where they just, you know, they just weren't into, they, they weren't into food. Like, I don't know why, but they were into video games. And so like, let's do video games. And so you have to, as, as people leaders, we have to respect the, that, that inherent culture that, you know what, what, what worked for one company doesn't necessarily need, but you got to pivot. And I remember the early days of the pandemic where we were just craving connection. We went on screen. I'm like, it's going to be funny hat day. I'm like, everybody was into it. like, yeah, let's do funny hat day. The second time we did kind of like a funny hat day, like nobody <laughs> Nobody wanted to do. I'm like, all right, scrap that. Let's do it again. And then we tried cocktails because everybody was into like making cocktails. The third time we did it, like nobody wanted to do cocktails. It was like a channel that was being changed. Like let's let's do it again. So you have to pivot. You have to really take the lead from what the feedback is saying because what you don't want to happen. I've seen this before. I'm like, but we're having yoga and, and we're doing all this and nobody's showing up. It's like, oh, nobody wants to, nobody wants to do it. And if we're not paying attention to those cues or we're not paying attention to the feedback that everyone's saying, it's going to be like, oh, look at HR, you know, completely out of touch because they think this is going to work. So to that fact, every company has a heart and soul of what they like and what they gravitate toward to. And it's, it's up to us to get really creative. I'm like, ah, this is what's going to work. And it may not work again, but at least nobody's going to fault us for trying it once. Can I add, can I add one thing? Um, so, you know, of course we, we survey folks all the time. Like we want to know like what's going on, what people are thinking. One of the comments in a recent survey um, about the things that we offer, someone said, I might not show up to all the things, but I'm glad I'm glad they're being offered. I'm glad that they're available to me. So um, sometimes I think like taking a low, low attendance, don't get, you know, we shouldn't be offended by 
you know, the, the low attendance in, in something because people have good intentions in terms of like showing up, but they just can't because of work demands or family demands or whatever the case may be. Um, but I wanted to share that because that, that warmed my heart, like knowing that, you know, these folks have the desire to be there. They just can't for whatever work reasons right now. And so, um, I wouldn't say like act something or cut something because, uh, you know, again, if you, if the majority says, uh, we're not showing up, we don't want this, then you listen to that. Um, but I, I, I like reading those comments, you know, the, the open, the open text boxes, um, because there's a lot of information there, um, that fills in the blanks in terms of those, those standard questions where you, you don't get the same context. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Sorry. I appreciate it. We love, we love a good survey. We're almost out of time. So if anyone has questions, please let us know, but I want to go back to kind of the feedback portion. And so obviously a very interesting time in the world, in our own worlds, um, layoffs, reorgs, hiring freezes. Um, you know, one thing that I, that we hear often is like as, as leaders being vulnerable, obviously some companies are still hiring, uh, replacing, they're having conversation, they're getting candidates asking them questions they might never heard before. Is this coming? You know, um, what's the balance there in that communication of being vulnerable uh, and being honest, but also obviously having that balance of, you know, where's, where's the line here? Because, you know, things, obviously you don't want to share things that haven't been decided, but people are craving honesty, especially when they're not seeing you face to face. So I'm off the cusp here, but I think it's on a lot of people's minds, especially in a, uh, in a remote or hybrid environment, you know, where, where is that line of vulnerability versus uh, a balance of, of not sharing too much? I'm happy to jump in and start. Um, I'm probably more transparent and honest than people would expect from a head of HR. Uh, but I think I, I do it most of the time um, in a very appropriate way, uh, especially with candidates. Um, I'm pretty honest about what do we do well and what are growth opportunities for us, but also our financial stability and history as well. So, um, you know, we we did have to say goodbye to some valued team members at the beginning of the year in January. And I'm honest with candidates about that, about the reasons for it and what we've changed and done differently now to set ourselves up for success for the future. I think being a Series B startup, there's always an inherent risk any candidate's taking on and joining us. And when we're having people join us that might not be as familiar with startup environments and the risk of being in a startup environment, I help to try to educate them and set a clear stage of what does it mean? What is, you know, what does the landscape look like right now? Um, what are we doing to mitigate any risk of any kind of recession activity? Um, so I, I find it really important to be honest and open about that. Um, but for me, it's also working internally with my team to ensure that we're being super thoughtful about who we hire, why we hire, when we hire. Um, and honestly, I never want to work for a company that's just trying to be a rocket ship, right? Because that's what gets you into trouble, honestly. Um, and so I think making sure that your team internally is being really thoughtful about every hire you're setting out to make, but also then making sure you're having those open, honest conversations with candidates around like, what is the risk you might take on in joining us? And, and what does that mean for you, for your career, for us? Um, I think that's that's how I tend to approach that. And and I do have a bias towards transparency versus trying to shy away from information sharing. I like that. I mean, to me, that sounds like a, a more consultative approach, which I think people always appreciate. And a lot of people, I think, in the interview process, they don't start with or they don't get to what's the risk in joining. Right. But it's important, I think, to look at all sides because it's not you know we're not wearing rose colored glasses anymore when we just keep seeing you know sometimes layoffs reorgs etc i think people need to know as best of our ability of what position they're getting into and hopefully it's there for the long run for three five ten years that's that's the goal right any other thoughts um Barisol, jasmine celeste sure i to to echo adrian as well i think over the past couple 
definitely since 2020, candidates and employees were they're really attuned to reading the room. And you have to be, I'm, I'm gonna say it again, you have to be transparent about that. I think there is something specifically with saying, and I've done this, like, yeah, I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. And I'm going to try to answer as best I can in that moment um, as a leader. And and I also think that even with the events in the news as well, like you have to say, like I, I have had more people um, you know, after all had like, I'm glad we said something or I'm glad we're talking about this. And it's hard not to get navigate working in HR and tuning out the entire like craziness that's going on in the world without saying something. Doesn't mean you have to say everything, but acknowledging it, uh, recognizing it, bringing it into conversation somehow. And like, I think that shows the human side of HR. I think folks appreciate that. And specifically, I have a, we, we I am so fortunate to be working in workforces that have always wanted to give back and always wanted to do more. And like, this is how you have engagement because um, not only does it show us that we care about our employees deeply, but what else can we do to make the world a better place? Even, you know, from a, a tiny morsel more of um, giving back our time into helping. And so for us, it's, and for me, the way it's like, like I, I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to try to be as honest as possible. And I think folks appreciate that. 100%. Jasmine or Celeste, anything to add there? I don't think so. I mean, oh, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. You say yeah, that. everything's been said so eloquently. Cool. Um, I think we'll take a question. I see. Um, and I think obviously keeping things on the topic, and this will probably be our last one, is how do you get folks to open up who do not seem happy about being checked in on? Who wants to stab at that one? I I think that's a that's really not about the employee opening up, but about the management showing, giving them trust, starting with trust. Um, I, I think that there's that whole, you've got to earn trust. But I don't believe that in the workplace. You hire people for a reason um, and managers should know that you've hired them for a reason. Um, so, you, so you give that trust in advance. Um, and so I, I, with having someone open up, I think that of course, making sure that um, they know that they can, they can be heard, that your team, your HR team, your people team, your leaders are actually listening um, and plan to do something that plan to actually act on the things that, that they're hearing. But I really do start, I, I really do think it starts with trust. It starts with, with management, with leadership, um, offering that trust in advance. Um, and that means, you know, not, not stalking and not micromanaging and, and giving them the space to do their job. And of course, it, and, and laying out what the expectations are, you know, like being clear about what the expectations are, what the, what they want from the employee. Um, I think if those expectations are set in advance, there won't be a need for someone to, to micromanage. Um, of course, if someone's not doing well, that's a whole different conversation. But if someone's you know, performing, if they're living into what they're supposed to be doing, there is no need for micromanagement. Um, I really do think that trust is the trust is the answer on the management side, on the leadership part. So it doesn't answer the question, you know, in terms of getting someone to open up. I think it's just communicating that we trust you, you know, um, and, and we're going to give you the space to do your job and to do it well. Yeah. I mean, I start, think I think it, that was a, just a great point. Sorry, just a double tap on it is maybe the days of earning trust should be over and saying, I'm starting with trust here. Here are the expectations here. You know, here's why we trust you. Here's why we hired you. Here are the expectations. And let's work on that communication level. But also if things don't go as well, I am going to check in more. We're going to have a deeper conversation as opposed to the opposite. Sorry, I interrupted someone. 
No, no worries. Um, I was just going to say, I concur with everything that Celeste said. And also will add that, you know, when we talk about checking in, like what does checking in really mean? Are we checking in to see how the person's feeling? Are we checking in on their performance? Are we checking in to make sure they have the answers that they need? What does that check-in look like? So I think it's important kind of to what Celeste's point is, the onus is on the people manager, the people leader to be intentional. And we're going to use that word throughout the, you know, we've used that word throughout this um, session to be intentional about the why they're reaching out. Are they reach like, what are you trying to solve? Are you honestly concerned about this employee? Do you think that they may not have an understanding of what their task at hand is? Um, really be thoughtful about what you're trying to get from them. And then thinking through and being intentional about who this person is. At this point, we, you know, we're working with employees from all over. They all have their own personality types. They they have their own styles of working. So I think it goes again to, to what Celeste said is building that trust. And part of that trust is understanding your audience and how to communicate. And so if this person has a way of working that is very clear, how do you check in and whatever intentionality that is in a way that's not going to be perceived as off-putting or annoying, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that goes in on the manager end to ensure that your check-in is received as intended. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, anyone else before we, we jump off? Okay, thank you so much, all voices, Adrian, Baricel, Jasmine, Celeste, I learned so much. Basically, a few pages of notes here that I'm going to type up, uh, but I really appreciate it. And I think this is, again, a very interesting time. And what I hear kind of some data that I'm sucking out of this is that communication, um, even just the little things of Celeste, what you called on of just saying, we trust you to start, that's radical. And that can change the tone of a whole relationship from the start versus saying, hey, you know, I'm going to check in on you all the time or I'm going to micromanage you. So that's my takeaway. I really appreciate everyone here. Thank you so much for attending and we should have a recording next week. Have a, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Great session. Thanks, Natan. Thanks Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.